if, if it is true, and I believe that it is, the atmosphere of expectancy truly is the breeding ground for miracles, then I have been anticipating this night for a very, very long time. Would you all stand to your feet with me, please? He is nationally and internationally acclaimed as one of the foremost authorities on Bible prophecy. He and his wife, Rexella, of course, host Jack Van Impey Presents weekly news program analyzing and evaluating world events in the light of Bible prophecy. I am like a kid in a candy store that I have the distinct honor and privilege. I, I almost got Dr. Falwell here before he went to heaven and uh, his best friend in the wide world is Dr. Jack Van Impey. Been friends for many, many years. I get back to my Baptist roots tonight with one of the greatest men God ever graced a pulpit with. Would you give him a mighty Columbus, Ohio World Harvest Church welcome Dr. Jack Van Impey. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, I don't run around with a mic in my hand. I can't be like Brother Parsley. <laughs> he's Parsley. I'm Belgian from Brussels, so I'm a Brussels sprout, and he's a Parsley. <laughs> I tell you, I've never seen so many animals in my life. I've got a message, animals in heaven, they're going up at the rapture and they're going to make holes in this church. <laughs> I've been waiting to get out here and if I had waited any longer, I was going to open the door and say, can I preach now? <laughs> Amen. Okay, folks, go ahead and sit down. <laughs> My wife wanted to be here, but uh, we've just had a lot of problems physically. Satan's tried to take me out three times now in the last four years. Uh, 65 treatments for cancer, got blood poisoning, sepsis, had a couple hours left to live. Uh, August 19, the blood was gone in the body. I passed out. They said if it, you'd waited another week uh, to be pass out, you wouldn't be here today. And I'm telling you, I never felt better. And I got... <laughs> now I'm gonna do a lot of confessions tonight. I got two metal knees. And it's a blessing because I couldn't walk four years ago and now they're chrome. But Seriously, the titanium only lasts 13 years, and mine lasts 30 years, and that'll make me 110. <laughs> I, next birthday, I'll be 80. And how I praise God, I just met your pastor tonight, love the man. I've heard about him for so long, but I just praise God that I look so much younger than he does. <laughs> you deserve it, brother. <laughs> Killing all those animals. <laughs> Boy, I'm having fun. 
But let me tell you now, this is a true story. Now, I used to have to sit down half a dozen times at the supermarket because I couldn't walk. And four years ago, Rexel had to come and get me because I couldn't get home. I got these two chrome knees. And I can walk now three miles in 30 minutes. But I have a tough time getting up and down steps, but not walking. The only problem with it is, the Lord is my witness, at home when it's quiet, you can hear my knees clicking. <laughs> and now that I can catch Rexella, she hears me coming. <laughs> That's pretty good for an 80 year old man, Brother Parsley. <laughs> Oh, God's been so good. I held over 800 church crusades, one week apiece. I went into citywides. We had 253 citywides with 10 million attendants. And 23 years ago, I said, I'm near retirement age, but I'm never going to retire. I'm going on TV. In all, all the 62 years I've been in the ministry, we have seen 2,500,000 come to Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Man, it's going to be easy to preach here. <laughs> I saw pastor on television a few times and I'm not used to a, an organ when I say something great, but woof. And I, I said, you won't do that to me tonight, will you? <laughs> I got to concentrate. <laughs> I, during my lifetime, have uh, memorized 15,000 Bible verses. And not by chapters, that doesn't work. Because when I needed verse 15, I had to start at verse 1 to get to verse 15. <laughs> and when you use 15 or 20 verses in the message, you got to do chap 20 chapters before it's over. And then my sermon would last as long as Brother Parsley's. <laughs> Can I come back again next Sunday? <laughs> Okay, we're going to get into the Word, and uh, I'm going to share some things with you that the Holy Spirit has done. I don't see the Holy Spirit, but this book says He'll bring to your remembrance what you've studied. I don't believe this stuff where a guy says, the Lord said, open your mouth and I'll fill it, and I've heard those kind of sermons. Yeah. The other morning at 4.30, and I'm going to give you part of that tonight, to 6.30, the Holy Spirit starts putting the verses in my mind, and I put many of the thoughts together you're going to hear tonight. It's not a miracle, it's hard study. I got everything memorized by individual verses, A to Z, chronologically, Genesis to Revelation. And oh, it's just so good to feast on the word. You know why you got these big mega churches today? Because the average Christian doesn't know a thing about the Bible. And they go to where they can hear two stories and a poem. That's right. Yeah. You got a pastor who preaches the word and I appreciate it. Because of my age, and illnesses. I've only taken three meetings in two years. The Assembly of God Church in Lansing, and I called Dr. Williams, friend of your pastors, my friend, my pastor. Dr. McVitie, who has the Great Christian College in Toronto, Ontario. And the other day, when Dale Berkey said, Brother Parsley wants you, I didn't even have to pray about it. I said, I'm going, I'm going, yeah.
Let's have a word of prayer and get right into the word. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And we prayed that tonight there'll be hungry hearts here who will come to the Savior at the conclusion of the service. Thank you for the great moving of the Lord this morning. And Lord, do it again tonight. And Lord, may every word that I have memorized over the years come through my mind and heart. Give me the anointing. I cannot preach in the energy of the flesh. I must have your touch on me for tonight. So bless this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be preaching, of course, on prophecy. And a lot of times alliteration is especially appreciated. And the Lord told me to, first of all, preach on the prophetic plan, and then the prophetic predictions, and then the prophetic preparations. A young man had just graduated from seminary. And he had seen all these preachers really moving. I started out with Billy Graham, and he used to really swing that fist. All of us tried to be like him. Well, this guy just got out, and he wanted to be a very impressive. And so he said, I'm going to preach on, behold, I come quickly. And the audience just sat there. He said, boy, I'm not doing well. So he got up to the back of the church and gave himself a shove and ran forward and says, behold, I come quickly. And there's still no movement. He said, I'll really do it this time. So he backed up and he swung his arm and he came running and he said, behold, I come quickly. And he shot right over the pulpit in the lap of an old maid. <laughs> and he said, oh, sister, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. She said, the book says, pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5, 17. And I've been asking God for a man all these years. But <laughs> who? But whoever thought he'd come flying over the pulpit? <laughs> oh, let's get down to business. First of all, the prophetic plan. I believe the next thing on God's calendar is the rapture. You're going to see why before I end tonight. What is the rapture? It's the literal, visible, bodily coming of Christ in the clouds of glory to snatch out of this world all born-again believers, dead and the living, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 18, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, frighten one another with these words. <laughs> Whenever I say that, it says, no, no comfort. Amen. Amen. But you know, a lot of Christians don't want to hear about the second coming because they are frightened because they're living like the devil. <laughs> You're going to find out how similar I am to your pastor when I preach. No political correctness. I don't want it. I want to be biblically right. Paul adds to it in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, be dead, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, the living, shall be changed. For this corruptible, the dead must put on incorruption. This mortal, the living, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying is written, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The rapture. I had a Scotch pastor. He'd come from Scotland, Dr. John Hunter. And he said, the reason the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first is because they have six feet farther to come. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go up together. And he told the story about James McGinley. I don't know if you ever heard the name. He was from Scotland, a Presbyterian who became a Baptist. And one night he's preaching, he says, friends, when the Lord comes, the Baptists are going up first. And then the Pentecostals and the Nazarenes and the Christian Missionary Alliance, and right at the end will be the Presbyterians. 
One lady came up after the service and said, the audacity, the nerves, the Presbyterians will be last. Go home and study your Bible tonight and come back and tell the people the truth tomorrow night. He said, I went home and studied my Bible and I got up and I said, I'm so ashamed. I said, the Presbyterians would be last. I now see in the book that the Presbyterians will be first for the dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> She didn't like that any better. <laughs> now watch it. When the rapture occurs, we're going to get new bodies. Tomorrow when you're shaving and looking in the mirror, don't give up. And you ladies, don't bother with a facelift. You're going to get a whole new carcass. <laughs> for free. <laughs> this is my favorite joke. I'll get real serious in a few moments. <laughs> this little Amish man said, you know, son, we don't believe in electricity, television. We haven't seen anything. All we have is this cart drawn by a horse. Let's go out and explore the world today. He said, all right, dad. So they got in the buggy and started going and wasn't long until they saw this mall. And he said, what's that? He said, I don't know. It says mall. Let's go in and see. They walked inside of one of the great stores and they saw the doors opening and closing. He says, what is it? He said, I don't know. It says elevator. He says, let's watch for a while, dad. Okay. And this little old lady walks up to the elevator. She's all wrinkled and crumbly. And the doors close. And he says, Dad, look, it's going up, up, up. Now look, it's coming down, down, down. The doors open and out steps a good, glamorous blonde. And the old Amishman said, Son, go home and get Mama. <laughs> Now, I've got good news for you. What follows the rapture is the tribulation, and you, as a believer, are not going to go through the tribulation. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass on the earth. Luke 21, 36. I show you a mystery. And what is that mystery? That we are going to be taken, and the Greek word there is ek, not dia, D-I-A. Ek means out of. Dia means through. He said, I'm going to keep you from, that's the word, out of, ek, the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world to test them that dwell upon the earth. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. And that salvation is the salvation of the body, Romans 8, 23. And by the way, if I had time, I could prove to you from Romans 8, 23 to 26 on the basis of 60 of the greatest theologians in history covering 500 years that they all taught animals, our pets will be with us in heaven. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna leave that one alone right now. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. There was a minister by the name of Bray who went around America preaching post-tribulationism, that the church is going to go through the seven years. And he said, I will give $500 to any man who can prove that this doctrine was never in existence until Darby of the Plymouth Brethren came along in 1830 with a retired girl, Martha McDonald, and taught this pre-trib rapture. $500. Well, a lot of us started digging into the word, and boy, that guy went broke. Are you listening? Now, this is deep. 
in the first century, Papia and Polycarp, close friends of the apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation said, he told us that all the apostles believed in a pre-trib rapture. 150 Barnabas who traveled with the apostle Paul, Acts 15, preached a pre-trib rapture. In 270, the Catholic Bishop of Pateau, Victorinus, said, we are going to evacuate before that horrible seven year period in earth begins. Get this. Someone says, ah, I don't believe in the rapture. You can't find rapture in the Bible. You can if you got a good Catholic Bible. Not the Doya Reims version, but the Latin Vulgate penned by Jerome. When he got to caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, he said, in Latin, the word is repiamored. We shall be repiamored, raptured, all before the blitzkrieg on earth begins. Then for a thousand years, we had the dark ages. Hardly anyone had the Bible. It was a time of great persecution. So for 1,000 years, you heard nothing about it. And then it started again. 1455, Hugh Latimer. 1620, Joseph Mead. 1640, Morgan Edwards. And then in 1648, we had James McKnight. We could give many other names. There is a pre-trib rapture coming. We're not going to be here for that horrible hour. Now, what happens after the tribulation hour? And by the way, there are 21 judgments at that time. If I could preach them all tonight, you'd be glad that Christ is coming soon. <laughs> there are the seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and seven bowl judgments. Every time a seal is broken, a judgment falls. Every time a trumpet is blown, another horrendous catastrophe. Every time a bowl is tipped, God help us. Now the seal judgments are found in Revelation 6, 1 to 8, 1. The trumpet judgments are found in Revelation 8, 7 to 11, 15. And the bowl judgments are found in Revelation 16, verse 2 through verse 18. 21 of them. We'll get into a few of them in a few minutes from now, but we're not going to be here. I am a pre-tribulationist and I am such a pre-tribulationist, I refuse to eat post-toasties. <laughs> Pretty good for an 80 year old, huh? I could say it tonight because my wife will never let me tell anyone how old I am. And then we ask her, how old are you? She says, can you keep a secret? And they say, sure. She says, so can I. <laughs> <laughs> what happens after the seven years? The Lord Jesus returns to earth to set up his kingdom. How we pray it every day. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 10. It's going to happen. Now, I'll tell you, I'm very disturbed today because we have four major Protestant denominations that mock the rapture, mock the second coming of Christ, and these ministers are in trouble with God. Why? Because there are 10,385 verses in this book about the return of the Lord, one out of every four. Some of these guys can't find one verse to preach. And that's the biggest disgrace in the history of Christendom. And you know how they get around it? They say, oh, we symbolize all these scriptures. For instance, when we talk about Israel, we change it to the church 2,604 times. And when it comes to Jerusalem, we just call that heaven 930 times. 3,536 manipulations of the Holy Word of God. I believe this. Dr. Walver, the great president of Dallas Theological Seminary and the training place for prophecy preachers like Hal Lindsey and others, said there are only 1,000 signs in the Bible in the 10,385 verses. He said 500 happen as we 
get into the tribulation hour and the other 500 happen when we return with Jesus. All 500 that say we're going home are here. We got the 16 Old Testament prophets from Isaiah to Malachi. We have the prophecies of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 17 and 21. These guys won't even believe Jesus. And oh, that book of Revelation, that's a lot of symbolical nonsense, really. I could take Matthew 24 right now and show you where every one of the predictions by Jesus can be found in the book of Revelation. I'm not going to do it right now, but let me just give you Matthew 24 for a minute. The disciples came unto Jesus and said, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Don't you dare put world in there. This world is never going to end. Fundamentalist Christians who believe the book don't accept that. It's the liberals who don't know anything about the Bible and who make Israel the church and Jerusalem heaven that preach that baloney. And I mean baloney. Well, doesn't it talk about the end of the world? Matthew 13, 39, verse 40, verse 49, Matthew 24, 3, Matthew 28, 20, and Hebrews 9, 26. Sure. But they're mistranslations. How can I prove it? The word should not be the end of the world, but the end of the age of grace as we move into the age of the millennium, Christ's return. Prove it. Let me quote it again. They came unto Jesus and said, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming to earth and the end of the age of grace. Don't say that's the end of the world. Why? That's Matthew 24. Turn the page. 2531. Christ returns to earth with you and me and his holy angels. And he says to those who are alive, and there'll be three billion there after the tribulation. They're not all going to die. And in verse 34, he says, come, you who are born again, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Inherit what? The kingdom. And when Christ comes majestically, royally, inspirationally, in Revelation 19, 11, on that white horse, the armies in heaven follow him. And he comes as the king of the kings and lord of the lords. And he comes to rule and reign for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. Now, I'm really going to show you something exciting. After the 1,000 years, he is recommissioned, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. And his kingdom goes on forever and forever and forever on earth. We're going to leave this third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, 3 when we come back with him. This is going to be heaven and earth permanently. Okay, let me prove it. All of you know Isaiah 9, 6. Unto, a child, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Next verse. And of his kingdom and of peace, there will be no end. Daniel 2.44, in the days of these kings, and this is the European Union I'll talk about in a minute, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom on earth which shall never, never be destroyed. It shall stand forever. How long is forever? It's forever. Revelation 11.15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Doesn't it say we're going to reign with him for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4? Yes. But in Revelation 22, 5, it says we're going to reign with him forever. Why? Oh, he's been recommissioned. So, ladies and gentlemen, since he's going to reign here forever, the world cannot end forever. Boy, isn't that a great deep theological thought? I love what Gabriel said to the Virgin Mary 
in Luke 132 when the baby was born. He said, your son Jesus is going to be great and he'll sit upon the throne of his father David in Jerusalem and he shall reign over the house of Israel forever and forever and of his kingdom there'll never be an end. Never an end means never an end. Don't you believe these phonies that say Israel is now the church and Jerusalem is now heaven? Don't you believe it? So that's the prophetical plan and program. The rapture, the tribulation, we're gone, we return with him. You know how important this is to the Lord? Jude verse 14. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. What? The seventh generation after creation. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, comes, he prophesies, with ten thousands times ten thousands of his saints. That coming of the Lord to earth with his people is so important that the seventh generation of history already was predicting it. Wow. What about the next port part? The predicted signs. Now I could go all through Matthew, Luke, and the rest. Jesus talked about false Christ and false prophets. Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, 24. Wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Matthew 24, 7, Mark 13, 8, Luke 21, 11. He said iniquity will abound. Matthew 24, 12, and man, it's here. One of the greatest earthquakes just took place in Chile. Do you know that on that day, the entire world was tilted? And now we've lost time. That's not an everyday occurrence. Well, I've always heard there be wars and rumors of wars. How can that be a sign? Because there were other things that had to happen with these signs. He talks about the abomination of desolation in verse 15 of Matthew 24. What's that? That's when the Antichrist comes to power in Revelation 13, 1, and a false religious prophet rises with him in verse 15, and he makes an image to the Antichrist and sets it up in the temple. Daniel talked about the abomination of desolation in his day, and that's when Antiochus Epiphanes put a sow on the Jewish altar, and God said that makes the holy temple an abomination. Well, this religious leader, and on my video, and we've moved 100,000 just in the last few weeks of number one and number two. I have Archbishop Sheen, the great Catholic orator on television. Malachi Martin, a close friend of Pope John Paul II, one of the leading teachers at the Vatican Institute, telling who this false prophet's going to be. You'll be shocked. We're living in the last days. In verse 21, he talks about, then shall be great tribulation such as never was since the beginning of the world to this time, no one ever shall be. That's the same thing as Revelation 7, 14. There was a great tribulation. The signs of Jesus in the Gospels are exactly the signs of the book of Revelation. And I'll show you why in one second. He also says in verse 32, when the fig tree blossoms, that's it. The return of the Lord Jesus because Israel has become a nation. May 14th, 1948, we're there. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light. Matthew 24, 29 is plain. That's Revelation 6, 12. There was a great earthquake. And because of it, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became his blood. Carl Sagan, now deceased, said that's when an asteroid hits the earth, and it causes so much debris that as it rises into the heavenlies, it blocks out all light for 120 days upon the earth, and he was an atheist. But that's the Bible. And it ends, happens right at the end of the tribulation hour. Let me repeat it. Immediately after the tribulation of those days at the end, shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. 
And Jesus in Luke 21, verse 25 says, there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and in space. On earth, there'll be distress of nations with perplexity, mass confusion. The sea and the waves roaring, tsunamis with earthquakes like we've been seeing so ferociously in the last, last few weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, I could go on and on. I'm going to give you the six signs why it's closing time. Don't ever say the end of the world. That's not so. Well, someone says, wait a minute now, wait a minute. It talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Don't ever forget this little lesson. The Greek word and the New Testament came from the Greek. Neos, N-E-O-S, means a new creation. Canos, K-A-N-O-S, means a remodeling job. Every time the word speaks about a new heaven and a new earth, it is not a new creation. It's a remodeling job because this world will never end, but he has to come back to straighten up some of the mess. Now, that's why Jesus called it the regeneration in Matthew 19, 28. And in Acts 3, 21, the time of restitution. Get your Webster's Dictionary out tonight. Regeneration and restitution both mean a remodeling job. Boy, I wish some of these Protestants would get the Catholic Catechism. Because in it, Pope Benedict, who edited the new one, constantly says this world will not end. There will be a remodeling job. And he's a far ahead of some of these birds who say that Israel is no longer in existence. Israel is the church. You know what the Pope said? He said, the gates of the holy city and all over on that side will have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're not finished. That's just some preacher who doesn't study the Bible who preaches that nonsense. I'm not trying to be politically correct. Amen. Amen. Okay, now what are the six signs? Oh, we could have wars and rumors of wars. We've always had that. So how could that be signs? Because they will gain in intensity and immensity. And that's not what Jesus said anyway. Yeah, but nobody knows the day and the hour of Matthew 24, 36. Really? You forgot verse 33. You took it out of context. Jesus said, you will know when it's near, even at the door. I can see the handle turning. But you'll not know the day and the hour. And the Greek is more imperative. He said, I command you to know when it's near, even at the door. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that we may not even get out of the service tonight. It's that close. Sign number one. And another thing Jesus said there, when you shall see all these things, then it's near even at the door. Not when you see an earthquake, when you see a famine, when you see some pestilences, when you see it all. But that all includes the next six signs. And when you see these things in connection with the six I'm giving you, that's it. First of all, Israel had to become a nation. In Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews out of their land to Babylon. They were gone for 2,534 years. No homeland. May the 14th, 1948, they came back from 82 nations of the world. And they raised their six-pointed star of David and said, we call our nation Israel. There. Ezekiel 36, 24, I'll take you from among the Gentiles, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. That doesn't belong to the Palestinians. Thank you. 
Amos 9, 15, I will plant you Jews in your own land, and you shall no more be pulled up out of your land, which I, the Lord God, have given you. And I'll tell you, the world loves Obama, but he's just made a tragic mistake. He has told the Palestinians, I'm going to give you Jerusalem. 930 times this book says Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. And I wish our president would get some Bible teachers around him instead of the people like Jeremiah Wright who preach Marxism, communism. Anytime you hear the word liberation theology, that's Christianity and communism combined. Jeremiah preached it for years. And listen, I love my black brothers and sisters. My head man, who is my associate pastor, just came back from Nigeria, representing Jack Finnepe Ministries. What a man, what a soul winner. The man who heads up my television ministry is a black brother, and I love them. But I gotta be true to the word of God. World War III begins because Jerusalem was given to the Arabs. Joel 3, verse 2. We're in trouble. 1 Timothy 2, 1. Pray for your president. Lord, give him light. Help him to get some good sound Bible teaching from some brother who really cares. He doesn't know. He never got it from Jeremiah Wright. Pope John Paul II went to South America. He was frantic because the Jesuit movement turned against him. They're having a real division in the Catholic Church as well as most churches. And he went to stop the message of liberation theology among his priests and bishops. You know what they did? Because he passed out his message ahead of time. Every time they saw when Pope John Paul II was going to talk about liberation theology, now guys, they all got up and said, Viva the Pope! Viva the Pope! No one ever heard him say one word against communism and Christianity combined. That's the message. Israel became a nation. Remember that song? Them bones them bones them dry bones them bones them bones them dry. Now the organ, where are you? <laughs> Now listen carefully, in Ezekiel 37, the bones are the Jews, not necessarily dead, but who've been in the graveyards of the world for 2,534 years. But now they come back out of those nations. Chapter 37, verses 11 and 12, I will raise you out of the grave and take you into your own land, and you'll call it Israel. Now, you know why that's important? Because in Ezekiel 38, as we're going to show you in a moment, Russia marches against Israel, and Israel is mentioned 18 times as the battlefield of the world. It's coming. You're going to be gone. Secondly, there had to be a Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem, when they take it back away from the Jews, which they're going to do, it leads to World War III. It's a sign. Luke 21, 24, Jesus said, Jerusalem should be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So the release started in the Six-Day War, June 5th through 10th, 1967, when the Jewish armies took Jerusalem. It's their city. The Lord Jesus is going to sit in Lebanon. He's going to sit in Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem's the city of the great king, Matthew 5.35. Your son shall be great, Mary, and he shall sit upon the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. The word of the Lord shall come out of Jerusalem, Isaiah 2, verse 3. 
The Redeemer shall come to Jerusalem, Isaiah 59, 20. Boy, you can't miss it. Can't miss it. And because they're going to attack Israel and because they're going to come to get Jerusalem back in Zechariah 14, verse 2, there had to be a Jerusalem. Never for 2,553 years. 2,534 for Israel being a nation, 2,553 for Jerusalem being captured by the people who raised the flag and said, we are Israel. They're here, folks. You can't get around those kind of signs. You can get around wars and rumors of wars, and you can get along saying, oh, he won't come. We've always had earthquakes. But the first generation in the history of the world has seen Israel become a nation and Jerusalem captured by the Jew because that's where their Messiah and our Christ is coming. The third sign is that there had to be a European Union. Revelation 17.10 proves that there are going to be seven world kingdoms. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is and one is yet to come. The five who were fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The one that was when John wrote it, Rome. The one that is still to come, the revived Roman Empire. It's here. It started with Benelux in 1948. Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg were the first three. Then in 1957, we had Italy, France, and Germany join for number six. And the Club of Rome said, we call this the revived Roman Empire and we approve of it. That had never happened in the history of the world. You've lived to see it. In 19... 19- 73, England, Ireland, and Denmark joined for nine. In 1981, Greece became number 10. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7, 8, 20, 24, Revelation 12, 3, Revelation 13, 1, and Revelation 17, verses 3, 7, 12, and 16, it says there will be 10 when Jesus comes. But it's to be a world empire. Right now, there are only 27. It passed 10. Were we wrong? I had studied everyone else, and I think most of us preached the same thing that someone 100 years ago wrote. Now get ready for the biggest shock ever. There are seven world organizations, and they've been in existence beginning 200 years ago. They were all working for the new world order, the one world government. It's here. That's one of the signs that to be in full blast when we're gone. Whew. Don't get discouraged now. It's a comforting hope. First Thessalonians 4.18. It's a blessed hope, Titus 2.13. It's a purifying hope, 1 John 3, 2. But it's here. Now, four months ago, the Holy Spirit awakened me early in the morning. And he showed me what was going on. This isn't just 10 nations. Listen to the seven groups who've been trying to create this new world order. The Illuminati. The Bilderbergs. The Council of Foreign Relations. The Trilateral Commission. The Club of Rome. The United Nations. And the New Age Movement. I can go back on video number one. Get it. And I got one solid hour of history proving this is not a conspiracy theory. This is what's happening. Men for the last 200 years have been talking about the new world order, one world government. The worst one was George Bush Sr., the father. It was the night of the speech when he giving it to the Union of America. He said... We are about to begin the new world order. Get ready for a bigger shock. The communist Gorbachev and Bush ran around in all this 
universities. And they coined the term, the new world order. This is democratic. This is Republican. It's everything. These are sinister, demonic organizations that have been working for a one world government. Now get ready for the real shock. The European Union with 27 nations, so it can't just be 10, has just divided the 27 groups into a 10 nation federation. But that's not it. They say we are going to control the whole world, 247 nations. And thank God Rex and I are preaching to all 247 every week now. I just pray the Lord lets me keep all of this straight in my head. I prayed, Lord, help me to make this simple. The Club of Rome, one of the seven organizations, is sponsoring regionalism. And they have just divided the entire 247 nations of the world into a 10 division world government. You want to hear who they are? Help me, Lord. Number one, America, Canada, and Mexico. Number two, South America. Number three, Australia and New Zealand. Number four, Western Europe. Number five, Eastern Europe. Number six, Japan. Number seven, South Asia. Number eight, Central Asia. Number nine, North Africa and the Middle East, all the Arab nations. Number 10, the remainder of Africa. The whole world now is being laid out in a 10 division world empire. That's here when we're gone. I can't impress upon people enough that we're in the final sign. Now, you know how I discovered this? The Holy Spirit woke me up in the morning and said, get back into your history books. It isn't 10 nations. That's what I preached all my life. It's the whole world divided into 10 regions, which is in progress right now as you sit here tonight. It was Rabbi Hagian over 2,000 years ago who said, a Gentile monarchy will arise and they will divide the world into a 10 division world empire. And this will be the announcement that our Mashiach, our Messiah, is about to come to earth. And their Messiah is the first coming for them. For us, it's the second coming, Jesus. Wait a minute now. The church fathers, Irenaeus, Barnabas, Justin Martyr, in the year 100, said, at the end, there will come a 10 division world empire, all nations on earth in it. And that's the sign that Jesus is about to return. What? They said it over 1900 years ago. You've lived to see it. Jerome, who did that Latin Vulgate and actually talks about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 in the Latin Vulgate, said, when the 10 world empire is set up on earth, Jesus comes and destroys the new world order. When did you say it, Jerome, 1,700 years ago? You've lived to see it. I could talk about Bishop Cyril and just so many others. This is it. All right, that is sign number three. The European Union becomes the final world empire divided into 10 division world government. Now. They also have to have a religious leader who comes to power in Revelation 13, verse 11, who has the two horns of a lamb that speaks like a dragon. The two horns of a lamb says he's a Christian who's defected because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. And the two horns of a lamb picture him. But he speaks as a dragon. The connotation is he's controlled by satanic powers, Revelation 20, verse 2. 
man, you got to get number two. As you hear Bishop Sheen and Malachi Markham, the greatest theologians in the Catholic Church in their day, and, and Malachi just died telling who it is. He's alive and waiting in the wings, just like my video says, Antichrist, world dictators alive and waiting in the wings. Cardinal Biffy is the one that gave me the idea for that. The Catholic Church is up in some things where some of these blind Protestants are mocking the second coming of Christ. Now get ready for something. It's the false prophet who creates 666. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, receive a mark in the right hand or forehead that no man, no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. All the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. 600, you know, a score is 20, three score is 60 and six. The infamous rock and roll Image 666. They boast about it all the time. Where do they put it? In the right hand and the forehead. Now get ready for a shock. Holler it back to me. How many organizations are there who are trying to create the world government? Seven. The Illuminati, number two, the Bilderbergs. Henry Kissinger is a mem member of the Bilderbergs. They're the most secretive organization in the world. Rockefeller says, when the journalists come, we have this thing controlled with police and soldiers. You must promise you will never divulge what goes in in these meetings. November 2008, in Chancellor, Virginia, they met. Kissinger was there. The word got out. They said, we are going to microchip people in the skin. All the world by 2017. Don't worry about it, you're not gonna be here. All right, so now you have Israel becoming a nation, capturing Jerusalem. You have a European Union going to divide into a 10 division world empire. You have preparations being made for the mark. Now the last three I'm going to combine. Russia must become a mighty power. China, likewise. And Iran must try to eliminate the Jews from the face of the earth, which the little Hitler Ahmadinejad is trying to do. He said, my Messiah is Mahdi. My Mahdi will not come to earth until I eliminate the nation of Israel and kill most of the Jews. That's the beginning. But Khomeini, who is his clergyman, who is the head of all clergymen in Iran, said, we don't care if our people die by the millions as Muslims. So an atomic war, which he'll start if he gets it. We know he'll use it. Don't worry about it, we'll be gone. Amen. Imagine, my savior, Mahdi, cannot come until I get rid of six million Jews in Israel. Boy, isn't that love. I love what Jesus said. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you, Luke 6, 27 and 28. That's not their theory. They're going for blood. Okay. He says, I'm going to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. I got news for that little Hitler. It won't happen. Are you listening? Psalm 83, verse 4. Let us cast Israel off from being a nation that their name be no more in remembrance. Blood them off the face of the earth. That's his goal. And it's in the Bible. It was planned to happen at the end. Not the end of the world, the end of the age of grace as we go on to the millennium. Get rid of that word end and say the end of this sixth dispensation to go into the seventh, the millennium. I change the words every time I see them now. 
Oh, boy. Here's what I told Amagina that lately on World Television. Isaiah 56, like Yahweh, God speaking. I will give Israel an everlasting name. Amen. <laughs> now, Iran is going to join with Russia. Persia. Do you know what Ahmadinejad just did? He said, we will not allow anyone to call it Iran in the future. You must call it the Gulf. You must call it Persia. We are Persians. Well, Persia joins with Russia, Ezekiel 38, 5. For the war, because they divided Jerusalem, gave it to the Palestinians. Big mistake. You're listening, get this in your heart. If I could take all six of these signs, I could show you where they all talk about it being the final signs. For instance, the European Union and the Mark of the Beast. Daniel 2.28. As he stands before Nebuchadnezzar, explains what's coming through this beast, the image of the beast. He said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you want me to interpret your dream? How fortunate you are. God has chosen you to see what's coming for the latter days. Latter days, that was written 2,500 years ago. And he talks about what's happening right now, then. The war with Russia and China, Ezekiel 38, 8 and 16, is the war of the latter years and the latter days. What? Does that sound like final things? The Bible teaches that Russia is going to move. It's the war of the latter years and the latter days. Who's involved? Verse 1 of Ezekiel 38. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Gog is the end time ruler. Could probably be Putin. Medvedev isn't going to hang around very long. You better believe it. Putin's just been waiting in the wings. And Magog is the name for the Scythians who populated Russia centuries ago. The Greeks call them Magog or Magogites. Meshek is originally the name of Moscow today. Meshek, Mosach, Moscoti, Moscovy, and now Moscow. Tubal, go home and look on a map tonight, is southwest of Siberia. It's spelled Tobolsk because it's the Russian spelling with an SK on it. All these cities are in Russia right now. What a war it's going to be. Chapter 39, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the Russian prince of Moscow and Tobolsk. Turn them back. I'll leave, but a sixth part of the five, six of their armies are going to fall. It's going to take seven months of every available man in Israel burying the bodies, Ezekiel 38, 12. But there's going to be an Arab federation with them. Daniel 11, 40, Egypt. Isaiah 17, 1, Syria. This prophecy has never been fulfilled yet in Isaiah 17, 1. When they try to come against Israel, it says, Damascus shall become a pile of rubble. They better quit monkeying with God's people. Ezekiel 38, verses 5 to 7 is Persia, Iran and Iraq, Ethiopia, Libya. In the Hebrew, for the Old Testament, it was written in Hebrew. It's Cush and Put. That's Ethiopia, Libya, Algeria. Um, all those countries, Morocco, Tunisia, parts of Africa, where the Muslims live. It's going to be a world war. In Psalm 83, verses 5 to 7, it mentions Lebanon and Jordan and Hagar's 12 different tribes that came through her. Isaac was through his wife, Sarah. 12 tribes there. It's the whole Arab world united with Russia. 
But Joel 2 verse 3 says, a fire devours before them, atomic warfare. They're pushed back to Siberia, verse 20. The only place in the world that fits Joel 2.20, bounded with two oceans, is Siberia and Russia. And as they're pushed back, the prophet says, I see signs in the heavens, blood, fire, pillars of smoke, nuclear warfare. Again, we are mocking ourselves, thinking that we can set us a, con, a, a contract with Russia. You can't trust them. Sure, they're willing to get rid of the missiles because those are war now won't work anymore anyway. Don't you know that? They are building the most powerful atomic weaponry now in the history of this country called Russia. They're getting ready. It has to be. Do you believe the book? Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Rosh, Russia. In fact, the word chief there should be a noun. And the noun is Rosh. A chief is someone that's head of something. Let me illustrate. My name's Jack, but a Jack also holds up a car when you got a flat tire. It used to. Now you just call AAA. Chief is one that's ahead, but the Hebrew word there is Rosh, Russia, Greek, Russia, English. What a day to be alive. But they lose. Now, the Shanghai agreement with China is that they will work with Russia. They have agreed to work together for the future. Revelation 16, 12. The kings of the east, the kings of the sun rising, horned oriental hordes come down. It's the bloodiest battle in the world. Not the one with Russia. That was mild compared to Revelation 9, 14, 18. Now watch this. Boy, God's meticulous. Loose the four angels bound in the great river Euphrates. Do you know where the Euphrates is? That's where your boys are stationed right now fighting Iran and Afghanistan. That's where it starts. Because they divided Jerusalem soon. And he says, these wicked angels that come upon the men of these nations, I mentioned a moment ago, under Russia, now under China, slay a third part of mankind by fire, smoke, and brimstone. Atomic warfare. You say, it's going to happen? Psalm 97, 3, Isaiah 66, 15, Ezekiel 20, 47, Ezekiel 39, 6, Joel 2, verses 3 and 30, Zephaniah 1, 18, Malachi 4, 1, all atomic warfare. God can't lie. But you're not going to be here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Let us cast Israel off from being a nation. With these four liberal Protestant denominations, you don't have to cast them off. They're already finished. Israel's the church. Bunk! <laughs> I'm being politically correct. <laughs> I looked at pastor's book and I got more fired up to be biblically correct. China. Where is the battlefield of the world? Right now, they're negotiating with Israel. Hillary Clinton says, we will help Israel. 30 nations now say they will. Man, it's going to be a blitzkrieg. But where does Russia march? Where does China come down to? Israel. 18 times, chapter 38, verses 8, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Chapter 39, verses 2, 4, twice in 7, 9, 11, 12, 17, 22, 23, 25, 29. If you don't believe that's Israel, check me out. Folks, do you see where we are tonight? All right, let me give it one more swing here. All the signs were meaningless for hundreds of years until we had the big six. Israel becoming a nation, the Jews capturing Jerusalem, 
the European Union coming into power and dividing the world into a 10 division world empire, the microchipping of the people, which the Bilderbergs plan to do in 2017, every human being, a powerful Russia that invades Israel along with China and the little maniac behind it all, Ahmadinejad, they're all here. You've never had this combination before. But wait a minute, the final sign is now in progress. Nothing else has to happen. The new world order, the 10 division world empire. You know how I know that it's closing time? Because when Jesus returns with you and me, he destroys the new world order and its leaders. Second Thessalonians 2.8. I could go on and on, but I'm going to come to a close right now. The preparations. Are you safe? Please don't leave. Are you ready? We're going to hear the sound come up hither, Revelation 401, and we're going to sweep through 187 trillion billions of miles in 11 one hundredths of a second. And they're going to say, hey, there goes Van Impey with his chrome knees of bionic rapture. <laughs> Hey, don't play church. Jesus said, this people honor me with their lips, but their hearts far from me, Mark 7, 6. You are they which justify yourselves before men by what you say, Luke 16, 16. They profess that they know God. Oh, they know the language, but in works they deny him. And Jesus said, in the last day, there'll be false prophets, and they're going to say Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, preached in your name, and in your name cast out devils, and in your name have done many wonderful works, then will I, Jesus, profess and say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, you bunch of sinners. You knew the language, but you didn't live a life. Oh, what's going on today? 50% of the Christian men attending Promise Keepers admitted they were involved in pornography. You sit around in that little thing all day long and look at nude bodies, you're gonna miss heaven! Right. Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Even Jimmy Carter admitted to that one. Remember, <laughs> they have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Second Peter 2, 14, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of God is not, is not, is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he who doeth the will of God abides forever. I'm telling you the truth. I'm ashamed of what's going on. One of the greatest Baptist schools I used to preach there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Detroit Free Press said, we have lifted the drinking ban because there's nothing in the Bible against liquor. Wait a minute. One of the English professors, he must be the biggest dodo alive, said, now get it. Oh, in my day, they used to preach on lipstick and playing cards and it wasn't in the Bible. Right! We're not complaining about that. We're complaining about booze that sends men to hell. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and who serves deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Be not among wine drinkers. Proverbs 23, 20. And listen to Proverbs 23, 31. Look not upon the wine when it's red, when it moves itself. Fermentation. Why? Because no drunkard can enter the kingdom of heaven, 1 Corinthians 6.10 and Galatians 5.19. Get this one all the way. 
The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, and revelings, of the which I tell you before, so tell I now again, that those who do these things shall not, shall not, shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I am sick of the Christianity. I see six Christian colleges have lifted the ban on drinking. And the secular colleges are sick because their students are in these blitz drinking bouts. Now the Christians can do it. Where has Christianity gone? I've been in this 62 years. 50 years ago when I preached these things, the crowd agreed like you're agreeing tonight. Not now. I've been in churches when I talk this, and I'd see an entire deacon's board walk out. Yeah. 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 We do anything, everything. Listen, the first thing that happens when we're raptured is the Bema seat. That was the special seat at the Olympics. The Apostle Paul attended the Olympics. 2,000 years ago in Greece. He even described the three medals in 1 Corinthians 3.12, gold, silver, and precious stones. And you and I, as soon as we get there, are going to have to answer for the way we've been living. You think you're getting away with it? At the Olympics, they had the great Bema seat where the judge sat. It was high and uplifted. So as he looked down, there were no heads or bodies to hinder his view. God says, I'm watching you. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Second Chronicles 16, 9. My eyes are upon all their ways. Jeremiah 16, 17. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You're going to give I can account for these girly pictures that you fool around with all the time. Mental adultery. You're going to give an account for your booze. I got a book alcohol the beloved enemy and I prove every time the word wine appears in the Bible when it's fermented you're not allowed to drink it because grape juice was also called wine grape jelly was called wine and when God says be not among wine rivers he didn't mean be not among jelly eaters now did he Oh, the church of Jesus is loaded with sin. I don't know of a church that's preaching like your pastor's preaching on sin and naming it. You know, these big mega churches, sure they're full. Two stories in a poem. Hallelujah. Isn't this wonderful? Nobody said a thing about sin, even Schuler. In Christianity today, was exposed for saying, don't ever mention sin. You will help them to lose their self-esteem. Doesn't matter that sin is mentioned 613 times. I, brother, I'll tell you, when you got a crowd like you have here and they preach like you do, it says something. Why? Here's how you empty every one of these mega churches where they first of all, have two hours of rock and roll before they have their coffee lattes. Somebody just said it won't be long until they have beer and liquor for the morning service for these backslidden people in these churches. Van Epi will never say it if I can't give the scriptures. I've got every word on wine from Genesis to Revelation in my book, Alcohol of Lit, and you can't drink it if you're a believer. Thank you. 
So what's going to happen? 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. These are believers, too, that weren't perfect. We will all appear before the bema seat of Christ where he's looking down that every one of us may receive the things he's done, whether it be good or bad. Now get this, boy, oh, what this verse is. 1 John 2, 28. It ends with Christ coming and uh, begins with it and ends with it. Little children abide in Christ that when he shall appear, second coming, we may have confidence and not be ashamed, ashamed, ashamed before him that is coming. Some of us are going to be saved as by fire, by the skin of our teeth, 1 Corinthians 3.15. No crowns, five different crowns, no rewards to lay at the feet of Jesus in Revelation 4.11 saying, Thou art worthy, Jesus. There are preparations to be made tonight. And I want everyone that you bow your heads and start praying that the Holy Spirit will work here. Every head bowed, please. No one leaving right now. This is a precious moment. I'm talking to you who have never received Christ. You want to be ready for the great moment when he calls us home. It's about to happen. Pray this then. In your own heart right now. Just all, You don't have to pray audibly. Just to yourself. Lord Jesus. You spoke to my heart tonight through this man. I want to be ready. Your word says, if I call on your name, I'll be saved. Lord Jesus, thank you for the shed blood to wash away my sin. I ask you now to come into my heart, Jesus. Be my savior. In your name I pray this. Now, I'm talking to Christians. You've gotten away from God. These little things have been coming into your life. and You're miserable. Come on home so that you can hear him say, well done good and faithful servant. Would you pray this prayer after me? Oh, Lord, I've drifted away, but I'm coming back tonight. I'm coming back. I'm coming home. We will only have days left to live for you. And I promise you, God, I'm going to do it. Accept me back again. In the name of Jesus. Now, our heads are still bowed. How many of you will say, I just prayed one of those prayers? Lift them high all over this place. Amen, amen. Oh, I saw so many hands in the back. It's a long walk, but you'll never be sorry. Come on, come on. Get ready for the coming of the Lord. Amen, come on.